So we're down to uh, the last uh, keynote, and this individual had the opportunity of, of seeing the private industry, but also working with government. So we often focus on what we're doing uh, wrong or what people are doing wrong, but here's a guy who uh, is, got to see it from the start. Uh, I'm talking about Amit Yoran. He's no stranger to the challenges that government and industry are facing. Uh, Yoran, as many of you may know already, he's a president of a computer and network security company, RSA. He was the National Security Division Director with uh, DHS, and he took the post in 2003 and served as the initial director of the U.S. CERT. So without further ado, uh, Amit. Thank you. It's great, uh, great to be here, and uh, it's great to have this highly coveted, late in the day, uh, speaking opportunity. But at least I got this really cool camouflage pen out of, uh, out of the day. Colorblind, I assure you, I'll never find it in grass or otherwise. Um, in appreciation, I'll likely be shortly making a donation to the uh, Coast Guard Cyber Initiative uh, program. <laughs> But uh, in, in all seriousness, this is a field that you know, so many of us have been in for a long time and are, are so passionate about. I had the uh, privilege of being a uh, cadet in 1991, taking West Point's first ever uh, InfoSec class taught by an Air Force Academy grad that was working at NSA and, and was on loan to, uh, uh, to West Point. And it was absolutely awesome and a great way to become very passionate for an entire lifetime about this uh, about this field. I've had a uh, uh, slightly schizophrenic career between public and, uh, and private industry, but I did want to say how in awe uh, I was today of the, the content and the quality of the, the dialogue and the discussion, um, certainly the high quality of attendees, but also the fact that the uh, Army Cyber Initiative put together a pretty incredible group of, of speakers and dialogue, but folks that have radically different views from the service academies and the defense and intelligence communities, contrarians, folks that uh, may be unpopular to many of the uh, graduates in the room. So I'm also doing my best not to, uh, to read too much into the chance that I was given to address the group uh, or a statement that that might say about my popularity, uh, especially given the late in the day time slot. But uh, I appreciate everybody's dedication, sticking it out through, I mean, the room is still full, sticking out through a pretty long and, and intense day, uh, one that uh, has been very informative. But then again, many of you graduated from the service academies and you work in cyber, so you don't know when to quit. <laughs> uh, I also want to uh, uh, take a moment and state very clearly that, you know, the views I'll provide are, are my own views. They don't, uh, based on my experiences, my own awkward belief system, they don't reflect uh, the opinions or positions of EMC or RSA or my coworkers or even my family. <coughs> <laughs> Although these are probably uh, some of the only is uh, issues on which uh, Elad and I find ourselves in this strange and awkward place of violent agreement, something that we haven't seen in over 40 years. So that alone should speak volumes about uh, you know, the surreal situation that, uh, that we're in. I won't sugarcoat um, anything. It's, it's not me, um, and I don't think we have time for it. Uh, my uh, uh, views may be a little bit critical, but I don't think we're winning in the cyber domain by a long stretch, and so uh, a little bit of self-awareness is, is probably good, uh, good for us to hear. I think there are tremendous opportunities for success and progress in uh, public-private partnerships, uh, but I think we're far from that. We have some fundamental uh, trust issues that we face as a community, which, in my opinion, at their very core, stem from a lack of clearly defined roles, responsibilities, and misset expectations in a highly dynamic 
cyber domain. Government and private industry obvious, obviously and frequently have very different set of objectives and different agendas uh, in cyber, which frequently pit us head-to-head uh, -head against one another uh, in our efforts. In truth, the cyber domain is so broad and cross-cutting that you'll even see within government different agencies with different objectives and different areas of mission focus, bringing them into uh, direct conflict. More about that uh, in, in just a few moments. But without these clearly defined roles and responsibilities, it's unlikely that we'll ever be able to develop uh, appropriate expectations of one another and build this foundation of trust upon which any public-private partnership uh, uh, requires in order to be successful. Uh, the cyber need is, is great, as we all know, and we operate in cyber with the tremendous sense of urgency that it demands, uh, that the nation needs. Now, this also means that we have and live in a world where cyber operations happen quickly uh, and become de facto policy long before, they la long before they experience an active public policy debate and frequently long before the legal frameworks are broadly understood. Uh, and in many cases, well, some cases, the legal frameworks themselves have been classified, which uh, should boggle the mind and, and in our society cause, uh, cause a, a, a great degree of concern. The results of this are mis spent cyber dollars, uh, misset expectations, and the in inevitable public backlash which occurs upon the eventual disclosure of what some of these entities are doing in the cyber domain. So as a precursor to any successful public-private partnership, we really have to work through a groundwork of trust and transparency and work a lot harder to define the rules, uh, the rules of the road. I'm going to spend a few minutes outlining some inherently governmental functions in the cyber domain. Uh, I've been allocated about 30 minutes for my remarks, and the government has a lot to do in cyber, so uh, I'm not going to be uh, all-inclusive and, and omissions will be blamed on brevity. I'm now defining a new sir. I have some excuses, sir, uh, response. I'll begin with the intelligence community. Uh, the government should be responsible and is responsible for the collection of intelligence that is absolutely critical for our national security. That means the intelligence community can, should, does, and will continue to operate in cyber. That's been the issue of a lot of contention, a lot of public uh, debate over the past few years. Um, it also means that the government and intelligence community can provide us better capabilities around attack attribution in cyberspace. It was great to see this happen during, uh, during the Sony breach, and hopefully we'll continue to see more uh, attribution from the government. It also means effective clandestine activity in cyber, which will provide improved functionality for network defenders, improved insight into ongoing attacks, improved insight into which systems have been compromised, how they've been compromised, and what our adversaries are doing against us. Uh, the intelligence community should continue to be increasingly focused on these foreign threats. But intelligence efforts should be clearly separated from information assurance effort with very clear boundaries, authorities, responsibilities, and set of accountability. Uh, yes, we have great skill in our intelligence community, and the intelligence community needs to help inform our information assurance efforts. But we can't operate in a world where we have uh, confused authorities and responsibilities and clarity on purpose of use. Right now, Cyber Command is co-located on the NSA campus and led by a singular individual, great and brilliant uh, as he might be. This causes uh, some concern. The Department of Homeland Security uh, has fantastic mission and authorities in cyber, but it has also, in some cases, effectively outsourced portions of its mission uh, to the intelligence community. I believe these are fundamental flaws in system design itself. There's a clear and very distinct conflict of interest between intelligence objectives and those of, of uh, uh, system operators. 
Simply put, intelligence organizations prioritize intelligence and counterintelligence missions. Maybe that sounds obvious. Uh, which in cyber means they're focused on monitoring our adversaries, determining their methods and their techniques, tracking their activities to a point of origin, uh, determining attack technique and our adversaries' objectives. While these activities are very important, uh, certainly for the intelligence community and for the national uh, leadership, right, they also frequently conflict directly with our information assurance objectives. Uh, the simple objectives of system owners, operators, network defenders who are primarily concerned with the defense of our systems. And in the event of compromise, how quickly they can get the adversary out of our infrastructure and get back to a functional state. This distinction in core objectives is critical because it represents a difference in programmatic emphasis on information gathering versus system resilience and availability. For instance, intelligence and law enforcement entities often prioritize attack attribution while little value or emphasis is placed on this attack attribution by those trying to defend systems. Rather than sharing information with operators and better informing them as to how they can defend their systems and better monitor themselves, today's intelligence and law enforcement centric community mindset around cyber limit the amount of information which they're able to share and exchange with the private sector. Broadly shared intelligence degrades its value to that community. Uh, let me provide some specific examples here because I think it's easy to, em it's easy to uh, emphasize this in a theoretical or, or rhetorical version without having tangible uh, uh, examples. According to Shane Harris's investigation, in December of 2011, the FBI learned through an informant that Anonymous had compromised Stratfor's network and they were decrypting confidential information. The FBI worked with the informant to convince the hackers to move the Stratfor information to systems which were controlled by the FBI itself. Now, the reason they wanted to do this was that they could build a stronger criminal case against these hackers. Uh, during that two-week op uh, operation, not only did the hackers transfer the information to the FBI computers, but the FBI watched the hackers steal information um, from, on the financial information of Stratford's subscribers, delete Stratford's proprietary information, uh, and send about five million Stratford emails to WikiLeaks. The FBI told Stratford's CEO not to inform, according to Shane Harris, <laughs> not to inform uh, his customers about the breach and not to go public with the news that Straffer had been hacked. Uh, the FBI wanted him to wait so that they could follow the hacker moves and strengthen their case. On December 24th, Straffer suffered a devastating attack when the hacker stole credit card information, the emails, and destroyed four Straffer core server servers along with their data and backups. The servers contain the essence of Stratford's business. Stratford estimated that the hack cost the company millions in lost revenue and cleanup expenses. It also cost them millions in settlement of a class action lawsuit and the obvious cost to brand and reputation. Now, the FBI could have warned Stratford to take emergency precautions to protect its information. It could have tried to apprehend the hackers earlier. Right, these are fundamental mission conflicts, and this is, listen, the FBI does tremendous work in this domain, but the fact remains that there are fundamental mission conflicts between those trying to collect intelligence, those trying to enforce laws and prosecute criminals, and those trying to defend networks, which we can't ignore. Uh, I'm not saying this is a condemnation of the FBI's great work, right, but these are the types of cases and examples that we need to be aware of and we need to learn from and we need to evolve in, uh, uh, our policies and behaviors uh, as a result. The government and intelligence and defense communities in particular cannot and should not be in the business of defending private sector networks and systems, even those in critical infrastructures. Such monitoring and defense programs face significant cost and scalability challenges, and the true purposes of these activities 
play themselves out in different ways, right? Are we in fact monitoring these systems for better defenses? Who will make the intel loss, intel gain loss decisions to inform defenders? How will the decisions be made as to which traffic from which actors should be blocked? And then there's the practical side. How might government defensive methods introduce delay to networks or impede and degrade system performance? For many critical systems in the industry today, hundreds of milliseconds can mean a significant cost or impair a system's ability to be successful. At an aggregate level, neither defense nor intelligence nor any government agency or private sector entity can know the true purpose of, tra of traffic or the true use cases for which systems have been deployed and when they should be cleaned up versus monitored. Only the owner of a system understands the data set and can make those risk-informed decisions as to its ongoing operation. Just as importantly, taking on some of this function leaves system operators and owners to believe that, to believe that they don't bear the sole responsibility of defending their networks and managing their technology and business risks. The government will protect me mindset is a most dangerous slippery slope of learned self-helplessness and responsibility shirking by critical system operators. I've spoken about some of the challenges facing us in the law enforcement uh, side. Right? That said, the government is the only entity which has the authority to enforce rules and laws when broken by nation states, criminals, enterprises, and individuals. Despite the public fascination with hacking back, the great news stories about it, right, the universal and consistent interpretation on such actions by every attorney and legal scholar indicate that it's very clearly a violation of US law. It can also lead to great chaos at the operational level if you imagine companies starting to hack back on their own uh, authorities. Legislation and regulation. This is another area where the government has the responsibility to develop and pass legislation that can provide for public safety. Many authorities exist in the government sector specific agencies, but these authorities have had mixed adoption when it comes to the cyber domain. While the regula regulatory frameworks can be very helpful, Dictating specific technologies to achieve security is absolutely nonsensical and becomes dated by, by its very definition. Think of the uselessness of requiring antivirus, intrusion detection, and SIM-specific technologies. They constitute an absurd waste of valuable resources and security spend and distract network defenders from the true task at hand. Finally, and perhaps most significantly on this topic, the government has the regula regulatory authority and bears a responsibility to help facilitate free markets. Free markets cannot function without transparency. In our case, transparency into breaches, whether they affect PII or not, transparency into what the threat environment actually looks like to the extent that the government has that insight and is willing to share it, Transparency into what investor risks actually look like. Transparency into what good security and effective protective measures are. And transparency so that corporate decision makers and investors can truly understand the risks they face and be held accountable for the decisions they make. Where market imbalances exist, I would say uh, in the cyber domain it clearly does exist, government can provide incentives, liability relief, uh, evolve tax policy, clear articulation of responsibilities, and numerous other mechanisms worth considering. Through the Department of State, the government, the government can engage with other nations and the international community to develop international cyber norms of behavior. This effort has just begun and will take decades. But its importance cannot be overstated to ensure that someday we'll see the rule of law in cyberspace. On this front, the government has started fairly recently with the Department of Justice's indictments, but it can impose changes in trade policy and numerous other foreign policy tools at its disposal, including the use of force and armed conflict. 
The recent executive order calls for the blocking of property and financial transactions of perpetrators of malicious activity in cyberspace. This is not an insignificant step for the government. The body of knowledge in and around deterrence theory is significant and should be put to use in this domain as well. Where to date, all government and cyber criminals, all governments and cyber criminals operate with near perfect impunity. As one of the world's largest consumers of technology, the government has an opportunity to define standards for itself in the security domain. Government requirements to protect information and information systems is almost an exact duplicate of the requirements needed to protect private industry and critical infrastructure systems. With its sophisticated understanding of the threat and exploitation, government can define the functional requirements for a more secure and resilient set of systems. With this definition available, private industry and entrepreneurs will deliver. In this, government has a role in helping industry form national and international standards which improve interoperability, create greater determinism, and play a significant role in cyber. In mastering new and complex science disciplines, the government has traditionally played a significant role in funding fundamental research. I want to be very explicit on this topic. Uh, the government should not be delivering a set of disastrous GOTS capabilities uh, where the government cyber monitoring and defense requirements and needs align almost exactly with those needs of private industry. Private industry is combating professional cyber criminals and nation states online. Developing technologies that do that is a role and responsibility for private industry. And we're spending billions upon billions investing them in research and development. Where foundational research may not be practical or have near to midterm or have near term uh, or short term application, it's unlikely to get investment from private industry which has an economic investment mindset. That's a great role for government to play, which is not being filled adequately. And one more that's particularly important uh, in our great and any free and open society is ensuring privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties are respected. For the past 15 years, external threats have been used as excuses to encroach upon traditional rights to privacy and civil liberties. We can't continue to let this happen. There was a great discussion earlier today on the new crypto war. Current policy leanings in this direction are greatly misinformed and ill-advised and would have minimal national security benefit. Smart bad guys aren't going to use the technologies that government will have access to their information. Almost certainly, these types of policies will harm U.S. corporations' competitiveness overseas, where we can't forget our corporations are still struggling based on the Snowden disclosures. Current concepts around policy will also weaken the security available to those defending systems where the deck is already stacked against us. The role of the private sector is probably a lot more straightforward. As the owners and operators of the nation's critical infrastructures, we're responsible for securing it. Private sector needs to take responsibilities for its own cyber defenses. Whether you do accounting for it or not, efficiency gains of technology are not risk-free. The, the private industry has a responsibility to know, understand, and manage that risk effectively. The cost of using technology and doing business means protecting your enterprise and its information. Developing critical technologies and driving innovation in the area of cybersecurity. For too long, the private sector has settled for iterative in innovation in cyber while our adversaries are advancing at an exponential rate. This year, I was happy to see the over 500 vendors sponsoring at the RSA conference. That number is up 20% from last year's record. Numerous others were holed up in hotel rooms rather than sponsor the conference, but providing a great degree of innovation. And I'm excited to report that so many of the companies presenting 
we're not pushing compliance as their primary mes message. We're trying to drive new innovative approaches to our challenges. Beyond the development of technologies, the private sector must also take responsibility for an active role in cyber strategy and policy debate, something that industry has not done very well. These concepts may seem commonsensical to many of you. No doubt I've probably pissed off others in the room. Uh, that's okay, you're entitled to be wrong. <laughs> the, the, the important thing is that as we begin with this debate, to establish a clear and transparent set of expectations on the various actors and processes in both public and private sectors. Something that I think is absolutely foundational for building blocks of trust and an effective public-private partnership. We've been taught to lead. The folks in this room need to lead more actively. Many of the public-private partnerships to date, and even some of the President's new cyber initiatives, are focused on information sharing. When done correctly, there can be great value to its participants. That said, so many of these sharing concepts are left in the app, at the apple pie level and don't get into the meaty and meaningful topics which define their ultimate success or failure. Who is being asked to share? What are they being asked to share? Very specifically, when and how are they being asked to share information? How will this information be used? How will, be, how will it be protected from disclosure, both legally and operationally? Who will have access to it? What are the liabilities and assurances which can be provided? And most importantly and fundamentally, why? Why should this information be shared? What is the value proposition for sharing for the disclosing party? Whether you're in government or in private sector, you can only put yourself in the middle of a process or PowerPoint slide for so long without adding value to the other participants of that process before they lose interest. The government has great expertise and value it can contribute to the partnerships in this domain, but it requires creativity and out-of-the-box thinking about how things can be done differently. To state the obvious, I don't think we've gotten it quite right yet. Thank you. <laughs>